Good morning, folks. So Wednesday morning, and I'm going to try and finish this chapter uh, four that we're on in terms of uh, histology. The last thing we talked about was transitional epithelium down in our bladder, and so it stretches. That's on page 134. So if you would, as you look at this, uh, follow me on 134. You see in the second column, glandular epithelial. Epithelia, plural for epithelium. And if you had, if someone were to ask you, what's a gland? And you can tell them right there in one little sentence, it's a structure, which might not satisfy them, but it's a structure that makes and secretes a product that this body needs. And you see it says glands arise from epithelial tissue. Now, this is another thing that just blows me away. We come from one cell. This body comes from one cell. And so at points in the development of this body in the womb, we form our skin. And within that skin, some cells know that they're going to become glands. So they become that glandular tissue, which doesn't um, offer protection in the sense of, say, the outside of the skin. Uh, with its toughness and waterproofing and all that, but it produces a product that we need. And so we've got these glands all over our body that play a role in the health of the skin that covers our muscles and organs and so forth. Two categories of glands, exocrine and endocrine. You can read about those two and know the difference Note their location and uh, the difference between them. You come on down in that column on 134, and you see in the next paragraph, exocrine glands vary in complexity. What I want you to do is look in that paragraph, and you see the word goblet cell. Most of you have probably had a drink out of a goblet, glass of tea or whatever, and the goblet cell as you see, it's found abundantly in epithelial lining, uh, the epithelial lining of the digestive and respiratory tracts, and it produces mucus. Now, we have mucus in our respiratory tract, and if you remember, there's some cells in this respiratory tract, epithelial cells that have cilia, and the cilia pull the mucus from our respiratory tract down into our throat, and we swallow, and it goes to our stomach. We catch a lot of dust, bacteria, maybe viruses, obviously through the COVID, uh, in the COVID pandemic. And so what's caught in the mucus can get pushed down into our stomach and that's the end of it. We digest those guys, at least to some degree. But it's a process which helps keep everything balanced in terms of what we breathe in and bring into our body. It's a flushing mechanism. So it flushes the, the respiratory tract, at least the upper part. And so same thing is true in your intestine. You've got a lining of mucus that helps material slide through the esophagus, through the stomach, through the small intestine, offers a degree of protection and so forth. So mucus is very important. Maybe you could talk that talk about that next breakfast you have be a good breakfast topic right only for anatomy people and physiology down at the bottom i want you to know this and then we'll be i believe through with glands uh, yeah you see it in the last paragraph talks about merocrine holocrine and apocrine uh, secretion i want you to know merocrine you can read about it. it's nothing heavy merocrine and then 136, up at the top, there is uh, what they call holocrine, where the cell produces its substance inside the cell, and then the cell dies, it ruptures, and out comes the product. So that's the type of secretion. So that takes care of the glands at this point. Let's go over to page 137, and we're looking at the first column, and you see it's module 4.3. And we're into connective tissues. 
And you want to know, as it says there, compare and contrast the roles of individual cell and fibers within connective tissues, identify the different types of connective tissue and where they're found in the body. And then, of course, what do they do for you? Generally speaking, generally speaking, when you look at connective tissues on this page, you see connects and binds. That's a function, generally speaking. Support, okay, that's another one. Protection, that's another one. And then transport. We don't often think about uh, transport being a function of the, of the uh, connective tissue. We'll get to blood. Blood is a connective tissue, or at least it's been designated by anatomists and physiologists. physiologists and uh, it carries things all throughout our body. So what we want to do now, you, you know the basic functions there. Come on down on the second column on page 137, and you see connective tissue proper. Don't forget to do the flashback. We're going to find out that things that we looked at back in chapter one, two, three, and so forth, they're going to be brought up in chapter four, five, and six, and even 10, 11, 12, 13, so forth, when we get a little further along. But before they actually get into examples of the connective tissue, you see the cells that can compose the connective tissue. So you want to know fibroblasts. What do they do? You can read through that. Adipocytes, you already got that one figured out, don't we? And then mast cells. Now, mast is something that we don't usually often, uh, we don't use very often, unless you're a hunter and you look at mast, M-A-S-T, that's the acorn crop that comes off trees. Or if you're a sailor, you've got a mast, uh, sometimes a couple of them on a boat, and you can put a sail on them and let the wind power you. But here, and I'm not sure why they call it a mast site. I haven't looked at the derivation of the name. But if you come down in the paragraph, you see the italicized word histamine. Now, most of you probably have taken a histamine at one time or another. Or you've heard about it on a commercial. Histamine is involved with inflammation. And we're not going to get into all that at this point. You might work into it a little bit later. And when you get into micro, we'll, you'll certainly get a dose of it. But you want, it to, you want to know that it plays a role in inflammation. And actually, inflammation is supposed to be good for us. It lets us know there's a problem. But as you um, find out what histamine does, you'll say, oh, wow, boy, that's, that's a response to a situation. Come down to phagocytes. You already know that those uh, like to eat things. You got two categories, uh, macrophages, and then you can see neutrophils. I need to highlight that in green. So you have macrophages. If you look at the word, it means big eater, right? And then neutrophils, uh, they call them neutrophils because they, when they stain them, they don't stain black and they don't stain red. They're neutral. So you can't see the granules in there very easily. They don't have a color. Anyway, those are the basic cells. And now we look at the types of connective tissue proper. Come down to the second paragraph on page 138, and you see loose connective tissue. Loose makes it sound like, well, this shirt's kind of loose, isn't it? It doesn't fit my body like a skin. So things are loose, and you see is when you go down in there, it says it's all no, also known as a real or connective tissue. We'll stick with loose connective tissue. It has all three types of protein fibers. It has fibroblasts. Sometimes it has some adipocytes. And notice they're suspended in the ground substance. Suspended. It's like almost kind of a little bit of a, like honey. You know, it's, it's, it'll flow, but it's got a little consistency up to it also. Notice the last sentence. Loose connective tissue is found deep to the epithelium of the skin in the membranes lining the body cavities. We're going to, I think I sent you a little uh, Zoom uh, feature that talks about serous membranes. 
and we'll talk a little bit about mucous membranes a little bit later, but uh, re go through that little Zoom uh, presentation and underneath the lining of the epithelial cells is gonna be loose connective tissue. You see it says it lines the body cavities and, uh, and, and as layers in the walls of hollow organs like our digestive system or our respiratory tract. Notice its functions. Support has a lot of blood vessels in it. As a matter of fact, let's do this. Let's look at a good example just to help you get oriented. Look back on page 129. Figure 4.3, and you see these cells that are columnar cells, and you see they lie, they sit on a basement membrane, and then look down below. That pink material with the blood vessels in it, you see it says to the left, underlying connective tissue. So when we think of our skin, well, underneath the skin, which we'll get into in chapter five, here's loose connective tissue. Gives a little bit of give with our, with our tissue. And it's got blood vessels in it that would carry nutrients to the connective tissue and then through diffusion moves into the cells. The cells don't actually have their own blood supply. So they have to get nourishment from the loose connective tissue. As you look on page 139, back again to the first column, you see that little paragraph at top, and we've already mentioned gases like oxygen and so forth and nutrients. It also houses numerous immune cells. So we have varying kinds of phagocytes that are in place to protect us if the barrier gets broken. Very complicated little structure there, that loose connective tissue. So it's it's got a lot of flexibility to it. And uh, I think that's all I want you to know about those, that loose connective tissue. Give you a nice picture up top. The, the picture you see in figure 413, the one on the left, actually the middle, that's a picture. The right one you see at the lower right corner, it says LM325X. That's taken under a microscope. That's an actual picture taken of connective tissue. So you can see how it's not packed. It's got a lot of fibers that can go this way and this way and give some, give some elasticity to it and so forth. You remember those protein fibers? You had collagen for strength, right? Particular fibers for a net to sort of give support. And then you had elastic tissue, so this loose connective tissue can give. Okay, let's go to dense connective tissue on 139. And you see it says the ground substance is the primary component of loose connective tissue. It says whereas that is the primary component, dense connective tissue is made mostly of protein fibers. So the extracellular matrix is reduced in volume because those proteins take up most of the place, most of the area. So come down to dense, irregular connective tissue. And you see the collagen fiber is there as you look through um, line number two and three. And uh, let's see what else it says that I wanted you to know. You come to the middle, it says this, uh, since they're not arranged regularly like, like this, they're just sort of scattered like this. You see it says it, the connective tissue is very strong and allows it to resist tension in all the different planes. Stretch this way, stretch this way, can stretch this way. Height, depth, and, and width. And you see it's found in organs such as the dermis. Gives the dermis some strength. That's underneath the epidermis, okay? Gives you some strength there. Now, as you, as you look uh, also at the last sentence, it says it's also around organs. 
So it gives some protection and some joints. It reinforces our joints. Amazing. Those bones are right on top of each other. Got some other connective tissue there we'll talk about in a minute or two. Uh, but, but it gives some strength to the joints. Dense regular collagenous connective tissue. Tells you, well, let's, before we go, let's look at the picture on page 140. The middle picture where you see what just looks like um, irregular protein fibers. There's your picture over to the right. That's loose. Or I shouldn't say loose. It's irregular. You come down to where the collagenous fibers are side by side. Gives a lot of strength. Now look back on 139, and you see that, excuse me, those collagen fibers are arranged in bundles parallel, so they, they give a lot of resistance in one direction, this way. It's not like this way, that way, and this way, but in one direction. And very strong resist uh, tension. If you look at the bottom of page 139, it says the tissues found in structures subjected to tension in one direction only. And your examples there are your tendons and your ligaments. Tendons are amazingly strong and so are ligaments. You look at some of the uh, sports we get into and how demanding we are on the knees and ankles. Tremendously strong. But I remember one time there was a young man for the Atlanta Falcons, very good running back, and he could cut so quickly, and he cut one day when I happened to watch him, and that knee just snapped. He exceeded the capacity for stretch and stress on those tendons that uh, attach muscles to the bones and the ligaments. Had to stay out, had to get it repaired. So we can't exceed the capacity of these uh, connective tissues. And then you come over to the uh, second column and you see dense regular elastic tissue. If you would look over on page 140 and you will see at the bottom the illustration on the left and then the real picture on the right of uh, elastic connective tissue from the aorta. Now, being elastic, all of you know about elastic. We've got elastic on our, our clothing, don't we? And so maybe your pajama pants or something like that. You pull them and yeah, they kind of snug up to your waist and so forth. So the same thing occurs in the aorta or other blood vessels. When the blood is pumped, the artery expands. That makes, a, makes the arteries a little thicker than the veins. The pressure is higher in the arteries than it is in the veins. So we don't need that connective tissue in the veins. But the, the dense, regular, elastic connective tissue allows that vessel to do that every time the heart pumps, and it reduces the pressure on the wall. It takes up that pressure of the blood going through when the heart pumps. Then you got reticular tissue made of reticular fibers. And we said, I think in before it produces sort of a net that acts as a support um, structure. It offers support. Uh, as you look at the last sentence under reticular tissues, it also forms part of the basement membrane that supports all epithelia. That's what we looked at in that picture a few minutes ago. We had the columnar cells on top. And so it's like a net. It gives support. You ever slept in a hammock? Well, that's a net. So think of it being kind of like that. Gives you support. Come over to the bottom of 139 and you see the adipose tissue. All of us know that that's fat. And you come down to line six and you see adipose tissue has many functions. You want to know those functions. Very important. We want the right amounts. You don't want too much. You don't want too little. Again, we're thinking about homeostasis. 141. 
do the quick check on number one and number two. And they give you some pictures of reticular tissue and adipose tissue. And so now we are through with those connective tissues. And we are on page 142. We want to mention a little bit about cartilage. Specialized connective tissues. And you see they list them as cartilage, bone, uh, and blood. So cartilage found between joints, between or found in joints between bones. You read through it, you see it's here, that's cartilage. This is cartilage, not the same, okay? They're not the same cartilage. There's three kinds, as we'll talk about in just a second. But you see it says they can absorb shock, it's tough, it's resistant to tension and compression and so forth. The properties larger, largely result from the CEM. And don't worry about all those terms, but it's like a, a tough sponge. It can take a lot of pressure, it gives. And so that helps us not to wear, our, wear out our bones or damage them. Matter of fact, you probably have eaten cartilage. How many of you like to eat sausage biscuit? Go buy Hardee's or uh, McDonald's, pick up a sausage biscuit and off the yard to uh, wherever you're going to work or go to school or whatever, or at least go to school a couple of months ago or so. And you get this little thing in there chewing on your sausage biscuit and you, and you don't want to break up. That's cartilage. You see, sausage is made of whatever's left over after they take a pig and they pull out the back straps. And uh, that's what we know as a pork loin. And there's shoulder roasts and what they call Boston butt. Um, those pieces, those cuts of meat. Uh, but then whatever's left over, they'll grind it up and they will put, um, in, put it in sausage patties. Might contain brain, might contain reproductive structures, whatever. Pretty good stuff, though, when you put some spices in it, right? Put it between the biscuit. Get you, keep you going. But anyway, that's what you, you find that little uh, cartilage stuff is tough. You can't break it up with your teeth. Some of you pull it out. It's not going to hurt if you swallow it. It just goes right on through. We don't have any enzymes to break it down, but we're not going to do anything with it. So anyway, cells in cartilage. You see chondroblasts. Those are the immature cells. And then chondrocytes are the mature cells. And the mature cells you see as you come down, you see the bold print term lacuna. And that's where those cells list. Now, here's something that is, well, it's all important. But look at the last paragraph. It talks about how cartilage does not have a very good blood supply. That's why whenever we damage cartilage, it takes a long time for nutrients to move out of the blood toward the cartilage and into the cells. It takes quite some time to have it repaired. A lot of times people will go in for surgery. I know I've had some discs that were bulging. Uh, I guess, the, what do they call them? Uh, I forgot what they call them now, but it's, it's, not, it's a herniated, there it is. I'm looking for that big word, a herniated disc. And so, I went to a neurosurgeon about that, and he said, yeah, you're, it does an MRI. I said, you got a bulging um, disc there. So if you can let it rest, a lot of these will repair themselves within a year. That blood supply is not rich to the cartilage, so it takes a long time for it to repair itself. And he's right. I took care of my neck. I Watched out what I was doing, and it still worked out as much as I could to keep a little strength, you know. I uh, never know when you're going to need to move a piece of furniture. You don't want to be pulling muscles and all that stuff. So, anyway, they can repair themselves, but it takes a long time because the blood supply is not as adequate as it is, say, to some other structures. Up at the top, you see perichondrium. That's the covering around cartilage. And you can read through here about the three types of cartilage in the second column, hyaline, fibro, and elastic. And so you want to know uh, basically where they're located and what the function is. Got some nice pictures over here of um, hyaline and uh, fibrocartilage and elastic. 
So I'm not going to go through that. You can read that. And let's go over to page 145. And we're going to look at bone and blood for a few seconds. So what's the function of bone? Go back to chapter one. Look it up. What does bone do for us? And they give you some thoughts here. One of the things we don't often think about is that um, bone stores calcium. Now, I want you to know, as you come to the middle of that little paragraph, see where it says figure 4.18? You look at the sentence, it says the ECM, you already know what that is, a bone tissue has two components, an organic component and an inorganic component. What's the difference chemically between those two? Organic portion uh, accounts for 35% of the mass of bone, consists of collagen fibers. Of course, that's a type of protein, some ground substance called osteoid, like bone. The inorganic portion, 65% of the bone mass composed of calcium phosphate. So how is calcium phosphate, since it makes up 65% of our bone, different from the organic material. Think about it. You might see something like that in the test. See? The cells that make up bones come on down to osteoblast. You can read about those. The periosteum, the osteocytes, and the osteoclast. Bone is not a static substance. It is continually being reworked. One of the reasons I parked down here on the creek side of the campus is I have to walk up uh, what, three, six flights of stairs, and actually three flights. They might count the, the curve in there too. But that puts pressure on the bones. And one of the problems that older people have is they sometimes become inactive and they maybe they read a lot, maybe they watch a lot of television or something like that, but they don't really get any exercise. And the bones become more subject to fracture. So you want to exercise. You're not going to become um, Schwarzen Schwarzenoff. I figured that muscular, or let's look at the rock. Okay, you're not going to get to that point when you're 70 years old. Most of us are not. But we need some exercise to put pressure on our muscles and bones. Because when we stop using them, um, then they become weaker. And it's easy for older people to fall. So it's good to get some exercise. You see some commercials in there where the guy takes the stairs, okay, instead of the elevator. Okay, so much for that. Now we come to blood. And you can read through that. It's going to tell you the liquid is plasma. Uh, and so you've got these different cells in there. You want to know the cells. These are general. And uh, what, are the, what are their functions? And then on 146, you have um, three types of cartilage. You know, you've got a uh, quick check. Now let's look at muscle tissue for just a moment. <sighs> Contracts. Other cells can move a little bit too, but but the muscle cells are specifically designed to move the components of our skeleton. You look down at the bottom of page 147, components of muscle tissue, they talk about myocytes. That means they're muscle cells. See what the E, cell, myo, muscle. And inside, we'll get into this in some pretty good detail in chapter 10 about the filaments the little proteins that make up our muscle. And that's another thing that people need to do is ingest enough protein, get some exercise, get a little bit of strength and um, bulk on you. I'm not talking about becoming like the rock, okay? You, you've got probably some other things to do besides work out like he does every day. But anyway, when you come over on the second column, you see they separate the groups of muscles types of muscles into striated and smooth. So you can read about that. Striated muscle has uh, bands where filaments overlap. 
That's why you see light, dark, light, dark, and so forth. So they call that striated muscle. The uh, other kind of muscle called smooth has no striations. The filaments are somewhat uh, irregularly arranged. They don't overlap. So you don't see the overlapping. So that's the two categories, striated and smooth. Now, on page 148, they list in the first column, and make sure you go back to the flashback. I think that's probably in your Word document that I sent you. Excuse me. They divide the muscle into three categories, skeletal, cardiac, and they want to call it smooth. Smooth, if you, if you think about this for a second, skeletal and cardiac tell you exactly where the muscle is located. Smooth doesn't tell you that. Smooth is an adjective. It's a descriptive term in terms of what you see visually. I want you to put the word visceral, V-I-S-C-E-R-A-L, V-I-S-C-E-R-A-L, visceral muscle. That tells you it's in the organs. If a person gets into a wreck and their, their abdomen is cut open and out comes their intestine. That's an evisceration. The viscera have come out of the cavity. So I want you to learn that. You talk about three types of muscles. You say skeletal, cardiac, and visceral. That tells you their location. Now you already know about what they look like under the microscope. But think about where they are and notice that in skeletal muscle, it's long, skinny muscle cells, and they got a lot of nuclei in there. Cardiac muscles, they're relatively short. Got some nice pictures over here on 149. They branch like that, and they also have these structures called intercalated discs, and you can read about them in the paragraph. Nothing hard about it, but you want to know that structure and then the last thing is that the skeletal muscle is voluntary and the cardiac and the visceral muscle is involuntary. One place that the, invol that the visceral muscle is located is your GI tract. You do not have to think about that. It's going to move food all the way through the 25 feet that we have within, inside of us. Skeletal muscle, you control those are voluntary. They'll tell you some other places that visceral muscle is also located. Let's see, what do we got? A couple more minutes here. Module 4.5, nervous tissue. Nothing heavy here. It's just acquainting you with nervous tissue. And you see where it's located. Spinal cord, brain, and nerves miles of, of uh, nerves throughout our body, thousands of miles of blood vessels. You come on down to neurons, that's the main type of nervous tissue, can uh, generate an impulse or, or a message, a chemical message, can send one, can receive one and so forth. And then you have neuroglial, or some people say neuroglia. You'll find they say things differently sometimes. Those help to support the nervous tissue. Now, as you look on page 150, and you see the picture up top left, and you see they've labeled it, and you see those parts. So you want to know the axon, the cell body, uh, the nucleus, and the dendrites. And you see that tissue, I mean, that cell is in extracellular matrix somewhat of a fluid type thing with fibrous uh, proteins in there. So they list the parts of the, the neuron and they tell you what the neuroglia tells you. Now, that takes care of that. And on page 152, we talked about membranes. I've sent you a video, a Zoom video on that for, for serous membranes. And I've mentioned a little bit about synovial membranes. On 153, you see got a couple of nice pictures of 
a membrane-like structure, a mucous membrane versus the cutaneous. That's a mucous membrane. This is cutaneous. So those are sometimes referred to as membranes. And then I want you to read on page 154 about repair of tissue. As you look on page 154, module 4.8, you see, um, you come down at first column, you see tissue repair and regeneration. Put in the corner or on the side of that column, when we have tissue damage, our phagocytes come in and eat up our damaged or dead cells. They're the cleanup crews. Not only do they engulf bacteria and viruses and so forth, but they clean up the dead stuff inside us because that happens inside of us and on our, on our body too, but they don't get to this part. They stay within the blood vessel and just outside the capillaries. Most of the time for certain tissue, you'll see we can repair it. No problem, scratches and so forth. But if we get down deep and we don't have a regeneration, we have fibrosis, which produces a scar. So you look at the bottom of that second column and you see epithelial tissues typically undergo regeneration. We got stem cells that produce new cells all the time. We're losing cells every day. If you could see me with the right kind of camera, you would see epithelial cells coming off of me. I'm shedding skin. That's one way we control the amount of bacteria on our skin. That, that shedding means that we got to produce new stuff. When we get into chapter five, we'll talk about the layers that produce new cells all the time. Uh, you and I, we got up this morning and took off our pajamas or whatever, and we put on other clothes, and we left a bunch of cells in the bed. You go to sleep tonight, you're going to crawl in there with a bunch of dead cells, and they're little mites that get in your bed, and they eat your cells, and what goes in has got to come out, and pretty soon you're lying in a bed of mite manure. That's why we have to wash our, our sheets once a week. Those mites are not going to bother you, but take take uh, comfort. You're not alone tonight when you go to sleep. But read about the repair of tissues under epithelial tissues undergo regeneration. Smooth muscles do so. Neurons usually don't do it. Look at the factors at the bottom of page 155. Nutrition and blood supply is important. Okay, well, we have done the rest of that chapter. And I may look over here and ask you, I won't do it right now, but I'll, uh, I might look into uh, histology, uh, excuse me, the uh, 158, page 158, some questions, and just tell, send you that and tell you to look them up. Just start applying the material. Okay, you got to know it before you apply it. And that is the end of the lecture. So, you know where I am if you have questions. And... Uh, I'll begin working on chapter five, the integumentary system. Okay. See you later. Y'all have a nice day.